Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kathy Stenerson, and I am an analytical science liaison with Millipore Sigma in North America. And today I am going to talk to you and show you how to do a catcher's extraction and cleanup for hemp flour. Now this is just one way to do this uh, for those of you out there that have to do pesticide testing depending on your matrix and depending on what you're looking for there are different approaches and you have to find the one that works the best for you. This is just one way that I'm going to demonstrate today. So CATCHERS is an acronym and it stands for quick, easy, cheap, effective, rugged and safe. It, it's a, an extraction that uh, was developed to replace a much more um, labor-intensive extraction that worked with much more hazardous solvents. So there are four basic steps with catchers that we're going to use with the hemp flour because hemp flour is a dry material. So our first step, we're going to hydrate it. So, and then in our next step, we're going to add solvent and do an extraction. Then we're going to do a salting out step. And then we're going to do a cleanup. And I'll explain these in detail along the way. So to get started, I'm going to go over and weigh out my hemp flour. Okay, so the first step is to weigh out our hemp flour that has been, we have hemp that's already been ground up, okay, so that's already been done for me. So I have, I'm going to weigh it right into the tube I'm going to do the extraction in. This is a 50 mil extraction tube for catchers. Now this, this particular tube I like because inside the cap there's a ridge in there, plastic ridge, and the reason that's good is because when I seal it up and I start doing my extraction, I'm going to be shaking this too. And this ridge prevents solvent and whatnot from leaking out. So we're going to put our extraction tube on the balance and tear it. And I'm going to be weighing out one gram of my ground hemp. Now like I said, different methods, different approaches, but in this method that we're doing, we're just going to use one gram of material. There. Okay, I'm at 1.02, so I would record 1.03, so I would record that weight. That way, I can use it when I calculate my final result. All right. In the next step, then, a catcher is you add a seed of natural to do an extraction, but this is a dry material. Okay, um, so we're going to need to hydrate it with water first. So I'm going to add 10 mils of water to this, and I have water that is uh, generated by it's just deionized water. So from a regular laboratory deionized water system, that's fine. And I'm going to add, this is a 5 mil pipette. I'm going to add two 5 mil aliquots to this. Put my lid on and shake it up to mix it. And then just let it sit for 60 minutes to hydrate that sample. Okay, so now it's been about 60 minutes. Our sample's been sitting with, with water on it. And it's hydrated and ready to extract. Um, so the extraction itself is done with acetonitrile. When you're working with produce, this extraction was originally developed for produce. Produce already has a lot of water in it, so you just basically um, smash it up, homogenize it, and you have, have this uh, slurry. You add your acetyl nitrile, do your extraction, add your salts. Now the salts then will cause the, you know, normally water and acetyl nitrile are miscible. However, when you add salt, it dissolves in the water layer and it forces the acetonitrile and the water to separate. So they're no longer miscible when you have all that ionic content in there. And that's how you end up with layers. And the idea is, is that your pesticides are going to go into the acetonitrile layer, which you're going to draw off and then do analysis on. So because our hemp is very dry, we need to add water to it. There's, no, there's not enough water naturally incurred in there for us to get phases like that. So for the salting part, you have a couple choices for your salts that you're going to add after we do the extraction. Because we did our hydration, next we're going to add a acetonitrile and shake it up real well. And then we're going to add salts and shake it again. We can either add uh, salts that are considered non-buffered, and it's basically sodium chloride and magnesium sulfate, or buffered. Buffered meaning that there's different salts in there that, and this is better if you have pH sensitive pesticides. Non-buffered was the very first approach developed. Just the salts that are there to create those layers, okay? The buffered approach came later when there were certain pesticides that were pH sensitive and they were breaking down during the extraction. Now as far as if you're going to do buffered, you have two choices there. 
you can either do an acetate buffered extraction or a citrate buffered extraction. These two approaches were developed by two different people, one of them here in the U.S. and one over in Europe. Um, they were developed, and actually people a lot of times will try both to see which one they get better recoveries with. One thing to note, buffered versus non-buffered. You will, if you do buffered, you will pull out more background than if you do non-buffered. However, if you have pH sensitive pesticides, this is the way to go. But just be aware that is one downside. So you're gonna have to do a cleanup that's maybe a little more rigorous. So we're gonna go over to the hood now and I'm gonna go ahead and do the extraction part. All right, so now I'm at my hood and uh, I'm gonna be adding acetyl nitrile to actually do the extraction of the hemp. And whenever you're working with organic solvent, you always wanna work under a hood. So been sitting for 60 minutes and you can see it's it's nice and nice and wet there so I'm going to add 10 mils of acetonitrile I'm just using um, HPLC grade acetonitrile for this step you can use um, better grades if you find that that is necessary although this for, for what I'm doing this is going to be okay so I'm adding 10 mils of my acetonitrile closing my lid and I'm just going to give it a quick shake. Now you see that there's no layers there. It's all, I mean the water and the acetonitrile has just all mixed together. So one way for the shaking part to do our extraction, we can, we can do this by hand for a minute, which is okay, except if you've got like a bunch of samples, you're going to be pretty tired at the end of the day. A better approach is an automated shaker. So I'm going to show you an automated shaker. a benchtop automated shaker and I'll be able to shake up to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven samples at a time if I had them. And I can shake much faster and for longer. And the advantage of that is that you're going to get better extraction efficiency for certain things. Okay. And there's been studies that have been done that have proven this. So I'm going to shake my sample at 2,500 RPM for 10 minutes. So I'm going to put my foam down there lower this down and start it up. So as you can see, this is going to do a lot better shaking than I could do. So we'll let that go for 10 minutes, then we'll be back. Okay, so we're done shaking now. I'm going to take my hemp sample that's being extracted out of here. All right. Uh, you can see that it's still one layer. There's no phases yet. I don't have a nitrile and water phase. So now I'm going to do the salting out step. So I'm going to walk back over to the hood and pick up my salt here. I've got, I decided to use a citrate tube for this. Like I said, a lot of labs will try the different types of salts and see which one works the best for them. So there's never one method fits all. Okay, so, um, these are already pre-weighed out, these salts, okay? We've got a variety of salts in here. So I'm just gonna open this guy up. And it didn't leak, see that nice ridge there kept it from leaking. And I'm gonna add this, the salts now, just dump them in. And shake for about a minute. You, I could put it back on the shaker, uh, but you really don't need to for this step. The extraction part, which just happened, that's where you really need the shaker. So all I'm doing now as I'm just getting the salts in there, they're gonna partially dissolve in the water. So they're gonna create a very high ionic environment. That's gonna drive, if there were any pesticides, it's gonna drive them further into the acetonitrile layer. And then it's also gonna cause those phases, that's the water and acetonitrile to separate. And the acetonitrile will be on the top. So after we shake for about a minute, you can see this would get really tiring if you had a lot of samples. We're going to centrifuge this to get the layers to, to separate. It's much faster than just setting, letting it sit and much more efficient. I guess been about a minute. Okay, so I'm going to stick this in the centrifuge now. Now, a lot of times it's really common for your sample to warm up when you add the salts and shake it. 
Okay, so that don't don't uh, don't worry. That's uh, normal. So I'm going to put it in my centrifuge now. I got a balance tube here. And I'm going to centrifuge at 5,000 RPM for 10 minutes. And then when we take it out, we'll see some nice layers. So set our RPM up to 5,000, and we'll let it. Okay, we'll see you in 10 minutes. All right, so the uh, centrifuge is done now. So I'm going to take the uh, sample out. And that's what it looks like. So on the top, the green layer is the acetonitrile. We have an interface layer, we call that, of some of the hemp flower material. And the brown layer underneath is the water layer. And then we have like a little jelly kind of looking bit at the bottom of the tube and that's some undissolved salts. So now my next step is to take this top layer off and we're going to have to clean that. And you can imagine it's pretty green. So you don't want to inject that in an expensive GC triple quad or LC triple quad because it's going to get the instrument dirty when you do a lot of samples over time. So our, our goal is, is to, to get that green color out of there and clean it up. Okay. So first let's draw the layer off here, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the different options we're going to show for cleanup. So, I'm under my hood again, safety first, and I got myself a vial. I like to use glass for um, a lot of things, but um, it, in this case I'm using it so that you can see the color easily. So, nice and green green color. For 10 mils, you're usually going to get about 8 mils of acetonitrile back off when you extract with 10. That's the general rule of thumb. Alright, so I'm just going to draw up enough so we have enough to work with for what we're doing. Alright, that should be enough. Okay, so that's what we got to work with. So next tar part, I'm going to talk a little bit about cleanup. Alright, so now that we've got that beautiful green hemp extract, we're going to do the cleanup step. Now there's, uh, there's different options for doing this. Um, for catchers, the cleanup step uses loose sorbents, okay? So there's different cleanup sorbents you can use. And you may have seen them already available packed in cartridges that you pass your sample through. Well, in catchers, the sorbents are loose. So the idea is that you take some of the extract and you put it in a tube that's got loose sorbent in it like this, shake it up, the sorbent then retains the interferences, you centrifuge this to, to dry the sorbent down to the bottom of the tube and then draw off the superdatant which has now been cleaned. There's different sorbents for doing this and what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at three different options. Our first option is a mixture of C18 and PSA. That's this stuff here, it's white, this white powder, it's two things mixed together. C18 is an 18 carbon chain that's stuck onto a silica particle. So think of like the same kind of thing as what's packed inside of an HPLC column, some SPE cartridges. C18 will remove hydrophobic interferences because a C18 chain is very hydrophobic, so it's going to retain hydrophobic interferences. PSA stands for primary, secondary amine. And this material will remove acidic interferences. So think fatty acids. If you had any sugars there, because they have all these hydroxyl groups on, in their structure, it will retain those. The second thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at this same blend, but containing a carbon, GCB, graphitized carbon black. GCB stands for graphitized carbon black. This removes color. In our case, it's going to remove green color. Okay? Now, 
this is really good for removing color. The problem is, is it can sometimes remove some of the things that we're looking for. Some of the pesticides that maybe we're targeting in this will retain on the carbon. The same with, with, uh, with the other sorbents too. So you have to be aware of that, that if you're, you know, you're working with, say, an acidic pesticide, you need to look for an acidic pesticide. You want to avoid a mix that has this in there because it's going to retain it. So graphitized carbon black. So that's our third mixture, or second mixture. Our third mixture is a custom, is a sorbent blend that only Millipore Sigma offers, and it's called Sapel Q Verde. Verde is Spanish for green. And it contains three different things, something called Zisa Plus. It contains our friend, the primary, secondary amine, a little bit of that, and it contains a carbon, okay? But it's not this, quite the same as traditional graphitized carbon black, I'll explain. Now first, ZSEP Plus. This is a, a sorbent that's exclusive to us. It's a zirconia and C18 coated silica. Zirconia has some special properties for removing fatty interferences and it can also remove some color. Envy Carb Y will help remove the green, but it's not as strong as graphitized carbon black. So it won't retain other things that we want to see quite as strongly. Let me demonstrate. This is graphitized carbon black, okay? Graphitized carbon exists as sheets. So, Chlorophyll, which gives the green color to our hemp, this is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is what we call a planar molecule. It's flat. So what happens is when it interacts with the carbon, it goes in between the sheets and it gets retained. This is good. We want this. The problem is if we're looking for a pesticide like hexachlorobenzene, it too is flat or planar. So it can get retained by the carbon in the same way. That's the downside of this graphitized carbon black. This NV carb Y that's in the Verde mix is graphitized, but its surface area is much smaller. It's not as strong. So it's going to be able to retain larger planar molecules like our chlorophyll, but it will not as strongly retain the small guys like our hexachlorobenzene. They're gonna be able to escape a lot easier, okay? So that's the reason for the Verde mixture. So I want to see basically what my extract looks like when I use it versus the traditional PSA C18 graphitized carbon black. All right, so now we're going to do that cleanup step with those three options I just talked about. This is our PSA C18. It's white because both of those materials are white in color. This is that same mixture, but with the graphitized carbon black blended in there, so you can see that it's, it's black. This is the Verde mixture that has that lower surface area carbon, and then the ZSEP Plus, and then PSA. So it's a little more, it's a little less dark in color, but you can still see the carbon in there. So um, these tubes, I'm going to put extract directly in them with the loose sorbents, and then I'm going to shake the tubes for about a minute. We want one mil of um, extract. These are two mil size. You can get these in bigger size too if you need to clean more extract. So one mil. I'm going to put a little bit here so we have it. We can do a little color comparison when we're done. We're going to take the extracts out and put them in these nice clear test tubes so that we can see how they look. All right, so I'm going to cap these guys up. And after I shake these for a minute, I'm going to put them in a centrifuge to get the sorbents down to the bottom of the tube so we can take off the sample, the supernatants. So shake for about a minute. These won't heat up on you like the other extraction tube did. And this is another one where you could use the automated shaker if you have a lot of samples because it'll just save you from getting tired out. Okay, I'm going to 
kind of walk over to the shaker as I'm shaking just to save a little bit of time here. See, it's kind of a dreary day today for us. All right. So I got a different centrifuge that will handle these little tubes. really can't see what's happening in there yet because the carbon's all up and up with the sample mixed in there right now so we really have to centrifuge to get a good look at the at the extract to see what it looks like I need a balance tube too for that let me get balance tube okay so let's go ahead oops I forgot to put the lid on And we're going to do 5,000 RPM for about, we'll do five minutes. That should be plenty of time. All right, so we'll see you in five minutes. All right, and we're back. Centrifuge is done, and I'm going to take those cleaned extracts out of there. We'll take a look at them. All right, so that's the PSA C18 GCB. When we pull it out, you'll see better, but it, uh, the green's pretty much gone out of that. So we're going to pull out the extracts and put them in these tubes. It'll be a little easier to see. That's our balance tube. This is the PSA C18. And um, it's a little lighter in color, but it's still pretty green, looks to me. But we'd expect that, right? Because uh, there's no carbon in there. And then there's our Verde. Now the Verde, it pulled out some green, but not as much as the, uh, the, the graphitized carbon black did. So now I'm going to take these over to the hood and draw the supernatant off and put them in these test tubes. All right, so now I'm going to take the uh, cleaned extract off of the sorbent now that we have spun these down. Right, you got to do this kind of carefully because uh, you don't want to disrupt the sorbent bed. So here is my Verde cleaned extract. Now I'm going to put some in this test tube so that you can see the color. All right. And then I'm going to deposit a little bit in my auto sampler vial here. And I'm going to explain about auto sampler vials a little bit later. All right. So that's good enough for that one. Next is our PA, P, P, PSA C18 graphitized carbon black clean sample. That's pretty clear. Put my auto sampler around here. I'm just saving steps. That way I don't have to get uh, two sets of pipettes dirty. Okay, and then the last one I've got is just PSA C18 clean. Take a look at the color. Oops, missed my waste bucket. All right, so we got no cleanup, and this is cleaned with the Verde, so it's now kind of yellow. So the Verde took out quite a bit of the chlorophyll, and uh, it's still, but it's still a little bit yellow. Now, comparatively, here is the the graphitized carbon black PSA C18, you see it's almost completely clear. But remember the downside. Remember what I showed you with those uh, those cutouts of the molecules. It takes up the chlorophyll, but it's also going to more much more strongly retain uh, planar molecules that might be some of the pesticides that you're targeting. Now the last cleanup was our PSA C18, and that didn't have any carbon in it. So it, it's, it's um, a little it's a little green, okay? It took out some color, but it's still kind of green. So if you were to do a color scale, this is the clearest. This is probably the second, and then that's the third. And of course, no cleanup, it's still very green. So uh, there's always a downside to everything. You just gotta choose what works best for you. Now, I did put a little bit in some auto sampler vials over here for Getting ready for the instrument, after this step, 
there's, depending on what you're doing, there's different approaches. Now, some people take this extract and they will do a dilution into um, something that's more compatible with their mobile phase for LCMS, for injection. For a GC, some people will do a solvent exchange or they'll just inject it directly. It, it just depends on, like I said, what you're looking for, what you're doing. The um, vials themselves, these are pretty typical auto sampler vials, two mil. Now, amber and clear, you have a choice of amber and clear. If you're worried about photo degradation of some of the uh, pesticides of interest, I recommend you go with amber. If you're not sure, I recommend you go with amber, okay, just to play to be on the safe side. If you don't have a lot of volume to work with, there's these vials available with little inserts in them like I have here, so I don't need to put very much extract in there. The auto sample will be able to pick it up just fine. And these particular vials, I like to use for pesticides, they're called low adsorption. So these are certified for mass spec use, they've been tested for cleanliness, and also the glass has, um, it, it's, it's a high purity glass, so there's less chance that you'll have adsorption of your analytes to the surface of the glass or contamination from metals. As for the caps, the caps are also ultra clean that come with these. Now for cap style, if you're going to be doing HPLC, I recommend, we like to use caps with slits in the septa. See, these are, these are um, caps with uh, Teflon lined septa in there. Now this one has, you probably can't really see it very well, but there's a little slit that goes all the way through. It's closed right now, but that for HPLC, it allows the auto sampler to get down through the septa easier, less chance of coring and plugging. For GC, I use a solid septa because that's a very sharp needle that's puncturing that septa. So then you would just simply do whatever step, if you're going to direct, do a direct injection of the extract, you just cap these up and you're ready to go. Or if you have another step after this, you just take your extract and go ahead with your solvent exchange or dilution. So that's what I got for you today and uh, happy catchers everybody. Hi, my name is Jeff Rule. I'm a principal scientist here at Millipore Sigma at our Belfont, Pennsylvania location. So I'm happy to uh, talk with you today in this training session a little bit about how to perform a tea infusion experiment to study and characterize matrix suppression effects that we often see in electrospray ionization. And then I'd also like to show you how we can make use of stable isotope labeled internal standards to correct for these suppression effects. So we're going to start off uh, describing this tea infusion experiment. You can use a stainless steel tea as, as I've got here or a peak tea. Doesn't matter too much uh, in, in general which type you use. But uh, you can see then that I've got this tea coupled to our ionization source. One port is connected to the effluent coming from our HPLC column over here and then the third port is connected to our syringe and so here I have a, a one milliliter syringe that I'm going to fill with a solution of my pesticides in this case I have a solution of approximately 200 picograms per milliliter of my pesticides just in pure solvent and I'm going to connect that to the third port of the, of the uh, T. Now in this case we actually have a syringe pump that's built into the mass spectrometer. In some cases you may not have that, but you can purchase standalone syringe pumps to perform the same experiment. So now we've got everything connected, we can start the flow of the syringe pump that's controlled through the software it would typically be set at about 10 microliters per minute and we run uh, a sample of our blank matrix extract on our HPLC system so we we use the auto sampler and the same gradient that we plan to use for our real analytical work uh, we run we inject that sample and the T infusion experiment will then show us where the suppression effects occur uh, through the chromatographic run. So you'll see that more in the following slides.
Here again is a depiction of the tea infusion experiment. The reason we do this is so that we can see how our matrix, a blank matrix that we take through the extraction procedure we plan on using, how it will affect the signal intensity of our analytes of interest, in this case, pesticides. So we take a hemp or cannabis extract, we inject it onto the LC column. It ideally would be a clean uh, sample that does not have any pesticides in it. And uh, while we're infusing the pesticides from the syringe pump, we can then use the mass spectrometer to show us where the signal intensity declines as a result of introducing our extract onto the HPLC column. This figure shows the results of the tea infusion experiment. After injecting a hemp extract onto my LC system and column. So the colored traces show the signal intensity of a mixture of different pesticides. The uh, overlaid chromatogram shows where the cannabinoids eluded off of the column. This was done in a separate experiment, but you can see in this figure how the elution of the cannabinoids off the HPLC column coincides with suppression of the, the pesticide signal intensity. So the tea infusion experiment can be very helpful in understanding where matrix interferences come off depending on the matrix that we're looking at. So here we can see a variety of different candies that are expected to be quite similar, but yet you can see they have different colorants and likely flavorings, possibly other additives uh, in each of these different candies. So by preparing extracts of these and performing the tea infusion experiment, we can see if it's necessary to make adjustments to our chromatography uh, or sample cleanup for these different matrices. So I'd like to take this a step further in describing how we might expect these different candies with the different additives to potentially impact our, our quantitative efforts with these two simulated uh, illustrations here. So on the left, we have a situation where our tea infusion experiment shows relatively constant uh, level of suppression. And if that occurs across the retention time of our analog internal standard and our analyte, then we may get a true reflection of the ratio of these two components and get accurate quantitation. However, on the right, we have possibly some different colorants that cause this uh, increasing signal suppression as our analyte comes off. And so, the degree of suppression is different between the analyte and the internal standard. It skews the ratio of the two and therefore will create an erroneous uh, quantitation or possibly uh, excessive deviation in our quantitation in this case. So one possible scenario is shown here where we migrate to having a perfectly co-eluting isotopically labeled internal standard. Now, both the internal standard and the analyte see exactly the same degree of suppression, so their ratio is not skewed in any way. We can still get accurate quantitation. Okay, so you've just seen how a stable isotope labeled compound can negate the effects of suppression that we often see in electrospray ionization. So, uh, I just wanted to touch upon what isotope labeling is, in case uh, it's been a while since you've taken chemistry. But basically, you know that uh, we've got the uh, nucleus of the atom is comprised in general of protons and neutrons. And then in addition, we have electrons uh, somewhere orbiting around the nucleus of the atom. So when we have a heavy isotope or a stable isotope, we actually simply have an additional neutron in the nucleus of the atom. And so if we have one additional neutron, then our 
uh, mass, let's say we're thinking of uh, carbon, a normal carbon atom or the most abundant form of carbon is carbon-12. It has six protons and six neutrons. If we add one additional neutron, then we end up with carbon-13. And this is a stable isotope. It occurs naturally uh, in uh, all carbon in approximately 1%. And so what our chemists do is to purify carbon-13, for example, possibly uh, deuterium. You can also get deuterium or nitrogen-15 labeling. Uh, but we get this purified heavy isotope, isotopic material, and then our chemists synthesize the compounds of interest using the heavy material. And because it's heavier then, and we're doing mass spectrometry, we can distinguish our stable isotope labeled internal standard from the native or unlabeled analyte. So now let's take a look at a few other situations that you may observe when you're doing your method development or validation and uh, how it pertains to the use of stable isotope labeled internal standards. So we're talking about suppression. I want to just point out another type of suppression, something that I call self-suppression, that's commonly seen in atmospheric pressure ionization. And this is simply a result of getting reduced ionization efficiency as we go up in analyte concentration, as you would when you're creating a calibration curve. So in the absence of a good internal standard, our signal intensity will begin to decline as the concentration goes up. And this can cause nonlinear calibration curves. This points out, though, why isotopically labeled or perfectly co-eluting internal standards are so valuable. If we have such an internal standard, it will come off at the same time in our chromatographic run and therefore see the exact same degree of suppression or self-suppression, could be matrix suppression, um, no matter what the cause, the extent of the suppression will be the same for both the analyte and the internal standard, and we can therefore get nice linear calibration curves. This figure illustrates another type of suppression, but in this case from co-eluting analytes, as we might have in the case of a calibration standard. So what I've done here is to create a plot in which I've uh, got peak areas of hexithiazox when injected by itself and then also in combination with two other analytes that co-elute with the hexithiazox. These were fenpyroxamate and detoxazole. You can see that when the three are combined in solution and then injected on the LC system, there's an average of 13% suppression of the hexithiazox peak area in comparison with a situation where the hexithiazox is by itself. So this could conceivably cause a bias in your quantitation due to the fact that your calibration standards would likely have more than one co-eluting pesticide in the mixture. The next two figures then summarize the benefits of having isotopically labeled internal standard as we go through the sample preparation, the extraction, and the LC-MS-MS analysis. So in this figure, let's imagine that we've got an analog internal standard, one that does not elude at the same time as our analyte. We start off by putting the internal standard in at a one-to-one -one ratio with the analyte. As we go through the extraction procedure, we may find that we have variable recovery of the analyte and the internal standard so that our ratio is no longer at one to one. As we go into the ionization source for the mass spectrometry, we can get variable suppression effects as I've shown earlier with the candies. So for example, uh, one or the other of the two compounds will uh, possibly differ in terms of their signal intensity. This also tends to throw off the ratio that we measure in the mass spectrometer. 
and so will cause poor accuracy when we do the quantitation. With a stable isotope labeled internal standard on the other hand, or a SIL IS, we add at a one-to-one -one ratio with our analyte. And because the compound, the two compounds are almost identical in terms of their physical and chemical structure, the only thing that differs is their mass. They behave virtually identically in going through the sample preparation extraction procedure. And so even though we may have something like 50% loss in the extraction process, as well as having a suppression effect at the ionization source, the ratio of the two will remain the same. And because we use this ratio for our quantitation, the accuracy can remain very good. Okay, so hopefully you'll find some of these ideas, suggestions, and experiments useful when you're doing your own research. I can definitely recommend the use of stable isotope labeled internal standards and the T-suppression experiment in order to understand where matrix suppression effects are occurring. Uh, they may help you uh, uh, adjust your chromatography or they may suggest that you adjust your chromatography or perhaps go to a slightly modified sample cleanup in order to get cleaner sample extracts. And so in this way, uh, with these experiments and good internal standards, you can get the best quantitation uh, in your sample analysis. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest and don't hesitate to contact myself or any other members of our team if you would like to uh, consult with us more or uh, talk about your own method development uh, applications. Welcome to Kenner Lab. My name is Raphael. In this talk, I'll be sharing some tips and tricks for preparing instrument calibration standards for pesticides analysis. I hope that you find this information informative and that with these tips and tricks, you can continue to advance your laboratory productivity by reducing unnecessary downtime. Our robust portfolio developed by analytical chemists for analytical chemists covers a broad range of analytical solutions and every product undergoes meticulous quality control to maintain the integrity of your testing protocols. We provide chromatographic solvents, columns and supplies, certified reference materials and reagents to ensure you always obtain consistent results in your laboratory analysis. Let's go over the workflow for the analysis of pesticides in cannabis. First, we obtain legal hemp containing less than 0.3% THC based on the C of A. Matrix match calibration standards were prepared and split into two aliquots. A combination of LCMS-MS and GCMS-MS was used to evaluate 66 California regulated pesticides. A complete customer solution or workflow utilizing Sepulco reagents, columns, and instrument consumables was generated. The results shown here are an excerpt of an upcoming application note for the analysis of pesticides in cannabis flower to meet the, the current California regulations. Current California requirements for pesticides and cannabis indicate the following. There are 21 category one pesticides listed for which there is no allowable level. Methods must demonstrate the limit of detection for these compounds and all limits of detections must be at least 0.1 micrograms per gram or lower for inhalable cannabis goods. Any detectable amount of these pesticides results in the product failing. There are 45 category two pesticides for which there are prescribed action levels. Action levels vary by pesticides and are based on whether the product is an inhalable cannabis good or other product form. These compounds must be below the action level to result in an acceptable or passing product. We took a look at this list and we checked it twice and realized that they were going to we were going to need dual instrument approach for this particular analysis. Those analytes in bold are not amenable to electrospray LCMSMS. Triple quadruple mass spectrometers are designed for targeted analysis and provide the maximum sensitivity when performing analysis in complex matrices. These instruments have the capabilities of analyzing parts per trillion concentrations 
which is analyte and matrix dependent, typically parts per million concentrations and above can oftentimes saturate the detector or cause carryover from injection to injection. For these reasons, sample preparation is extremely important. These factors must be taken into effect when analyzing cannabis as it contains targeted components or analytes at the part per billion level, in this case for pesticides, components in the parts per million level, such as terpenes, and other components at the percent level, such as cannabinoids, among other components not just targeted at this particular time. There are many different possible ways to get analytes extracted prior to analysis in terms of sample preparation techniques available to us as analytical chemists. We can utilize SPME or solid phase microextraction, solid liquid extraction, catchers, which is an acronym from quick, easy, cheap, effective, rugged, and safe. There's pros and cons to these techniques when applied to cannabis flower or solid phase extraction, dilute and shoot, which is not a viable option for this particular matrix. The use of proper valves is extremely important as some pesticides photodegrade and also due to the lower concentration, analyte absorption can occur in vials without the activated surfaces, which leads to loss of analytes and irreproducible responses. Therefore, mass spec certified low absorption amber vials are essential to the analysis of pesticides using, utilizing any analytical technique. A more important, important question becomes, how do we get what we want inside the vial while at the same time minimizing the components and matrix that we do not want? Our selected method of sample preparation was based on how do we maximize analyte recovery? What would maximize instrument uptime? What is feasible and what customers were already doing in the marketplace or were willing to try? Let's go over the sample preparation steps. One gram of dried and ground cannabis sample was transferred into a 50 ml polypropylene centrifuge tube, tube A. To this, ceramic homogenization beads were added. In addition to 15 mils of LCMS grade acetonitrile, and it was capped. The tube was shaken for five to 10 minutes on a vertical shaker at high speed. Prepare a tube rack with Discovery C18 500 milligram SPE cartridges, 6 mil and 50 mil centrifuge tubes for collection. Add super ink from Discovery C18 SPE cartridge and less pass through by gravity. Add 5 mil of additional acetonitrile to tube A and shake for 3 to 5 minutes at high speed. Transfer supernatant to SPE cartridge, repeat with an additional 5 mL of ACN, and again pass through the SPE cartridge. Bring final volume of the centrifuge tube to 25 mL with ACN. This gives us a 25x dilution factor for samples. Let's take a look at the GCMSMS instrument conditions. Please note that the injection mode is a pressure and temperature program solvent vent injection. This was coupled with a sandwich injection of sample with analyte protectants. We'll discuss analyte protectants in greater details in the next few slides. A Supelco SLB 5MS column provided low chromatographic bleed at the ele elevated GC temperatures. The sandwich injection technique is very simple to set up with most, or most auto samplers and provides many benefits in introducing matrix, internal standards, or in this case, analyte protecting solutions as a co-injection. Here are the listed acquisition parameters for GCMSMS amenable pesticides in the California list. Typically, we use two MRM transitions per analyte, one for quantitation and the other MRM transition as a qualifier. However, sometimes I like to use a third and possibly fourth MRM transitions in case there are unexpected matrix interferences. And why not? It's free to acquire the third or fourth MRM. I say that with a caveat, however, there is no such thing as a free lunch. It's kind of free, however, you pay for it in terms of dwell time, which may affect your sensitivity and reproducibility if your method is not fully optimized. For example, you may not get enough data points across the chromatographic peaks, but that's a conversation for another seminar topic, perhaps at a later time. 
I promise we'll get back to Interlight Protecting Solutions. Here, we can clearly see the benefits of utilizing Interlight Protectants in GCMSMS analysis of pesticides. On the left, we see five injections of a particular analyte without the use of analyte protectants. And on the right, we see how the results significantly improved with their use. Analyte protectants are used to minimi minimize active sites in the GC inlet and sample path and to ensure reproducible and consistent results when analyzing pesticides at low levels. Analyte protectants are only designed for GCMS analysis not for LC. They do not function in LCMS analysis. Analyte protectants with, with hydroxyl groups, for example, sugars and sugar derivatives, have shown to be spe specially effective since they can block active sites in the GC system via hydrogen bonds. When using analyte protectants, significantly lower peaks, significantly narrower peaks can be obtained from many analytes. Thus, the chromatographic separation is improved, lower detection limits are achieved, and the determination of the peak area is simplified and more precise. Essentially, your analytes are sugar-coated. A key takeaway message here is that analyte protectants are important and required for the analysis of low levels of pesticides in any matrix, not just cannabis. Analyte response is dependent on initial analyte concentration. If you're analyzing PPM or above levels of pesticides, the effect is minimal at around 5%. However, if you're working at low concentrations, parts per billion concentrations, nanograms per mil, or especially parts per trillion picograms per, per mil, the effects are more pronounced. For example, as illustrated in this picture, you may start with 100% of analytes and end up with 10%. You may have possible analyte interactions which, with active sites in the sample vials, syringe barrel, inlet liner, column inlet, analytical column, mass spectrometer ionization source, all these sites prior to the analytes reaching the instrument detector. In this example, we see pentachloronitrobenzene, or PCMB, which is a problematic electrospray ionization LCMSMS compound, which is easily ionized and analyzed via GCMSMS. The minimum action level for pentachloronitrobenzene is 100 ppb in cannabis flower, which corresponds to a 4 ppb nanograms per mil in vial concentration. Excellent reproducibility and linear range are shown here with the use of analyte protectants. These isomer peaks for cyfluthrin 1 and 2 are summed and quantitated as 1. Please note that even though these peaks are not chromatographically separated, they can still be quantitated and the results are reproducible. The minimum action level for cyfluthrin is three micrograms per gram or three ppm in flour, which corresponds to 120 nanograms per mil or 120 ppb in vial based on the 25x dilution during sample and standard preparation. Note here the excellent linearity and reproducibility in matrix match standards for these sets of isomers, again, using analyte protectants. This total ion chromatogram illustrates the various components typically found in cannabis flowers, terpenes, cannabinoids, and other flavonoids. Note that the high amount of CBD compared to other components in this chromatogram. Here we see a total ion chromatogram of a 200 ppb matrix match standard with analyte protectants. In this case, the high CBD concentration did not impact the quantitation of the analytes that co in the same chromatographic region. Here are the tabulated results for the GCMSMS amenable pesticides in the California list. Note the excellent reproducibility, recovery, and sensitivity, as well as linearity reached for each individual analyte.
here's the tabular results for all pesticides in the California lists. Essentially, 60 analyzed by LCMSMS, 36 by GCMSMS, and 31 by both techniques. Let's take a look on how to perform a matrix enhancement, suppression, and recovery evaluation. For this, a set of calibration standards is prepared in pure acetonitrile and used to generate an ideal calibration curve against which suppression enhancement and extraction recovery studies can be performed. This is curve B. To evaluate suppression and enhancement effects, a set of calibrators is prepared from a post-extraction sample. For this preparation, a blank or control matrix of analyte-free cannabis is taken through the sample preparation procedure before adding the pesticide working solution. Comparison of the post-extract regression calibration curve with the regression performed in pure acetonitrile allows evaluation of either suppression or enhancement effects. Note that suppression or enhancement effects can occur with both GCMS and LCMS instrumentation, although the costs are somewhat different. Studies of these effects can provide insights into possible remedies that may be used to improve assay performance. To evaluate extraction recovery, a set of plant calibration standards is prepared. To this set of standards, is spiked with working solution and then taken through the sample preparation procedure. Comparison of these calibrators with those prepared from the post-extraction set allows evaluation of extraction recovery or losses that occur during the extraction procedure. In conclusion, the cannabis industry is growing and evolving rapidly in the U.S. while testing quality control and enforcement tries to keep pace. Our workflows are positioned to assist customers with the anticipated worth growth in testing. A unified sample preparation technique for pesticide residue provides customers with an effective way to easily reach the regulatory limits, ensuring that analyte protectants are used for GCMS analysis of pesticides in cannabis and cannabis-related products. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Have a great day and enjoy Kent Lab.